Welcome to Time to Heal. My name is Pam Hemphill, and on this show we talk about addiction and recovery. And to, on this show today we're going to be talking about treatment and the problems that we're having in treatment for our modern day addicts. And my guest that I have with me today is a gentleman in treatment and a professional counselor who's going to share with you about addiction and, and treatment and what, what are the barriers and what are the problems we're having. Uh, helping these people get into treatment and stay in treatment. So I'd like to first start off with Don. Okay. Well, I, I'm glad you started us on that path because I do think treatment's changed quite a bit. And what I mean by that is, is we still have traditional treatment and we have what I coin as modern day treatment. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's important that we start talking about modern day treatment a little more than traditional treatment. The addict's face has changed a little, Pam, and that, that worries me because I, I had explained once before in one of our previous shows how at, at one of the facilities I uh, oversee, five years ago, 75%, easily 75%, if not more, of our admits were traditional alcoholics or methamphetamine. And in that five years, it has radically changed. 75% of our admins today are opiate addicts, young heroin addicts, young people who are uh, addicted to opiate drugs, um, prescription drugs like Oxycontin. And what we've learned over the years is that this addiction is so crippling that it often needs what we call MAT approaches. MAT just stands for Medication Assisted Treatment. You know, I have had heart disease, I have to take uh, medications so that I can continue to live a normal life. There are some addicts, modern day addicts, whose addiction is so strong, their brain is so affected by their, their addiction that they need medications to help stabilize the brain long enough so that they can receive appropriate treatment counseling. And so we have young people like Brent in treatment, and we use medication-assisted treatment to get them stable. And then once they're stable, the counselors can then begin to break through the denial. You and I know what denial and how strong denial is, especially in early recovery. But when you combine that with a brain that cannot focus, when it's been damaged so much from the drugs that they're using, and I'm talking specifically opiates like heroin, that their brain cannot settle down long enough for them to hear the message, long enough for the counselor to break through the denial, you're wasting your time. So again, modern day addicts like Brent uh, needs to be stabled or have a stabilization going on, and we use medication to stabilize them so that then the counseling and the treatment can work. And, and, and I would like to ask Brent to, to chime in. Chime in, how did he get started on opiates? He's a young guy, and you and I uh, see a lot more young people in treatment, more and more young people in recovery, but I'd like to know how Brent got started, how he ended up tre in treatment, and did medication-assisted treatment, in his case, Suboxone was utilized to help stabilize it. Did it help? Did it work? Let's hear it from, from the guy that's gone through it. He's in treatment, about ready to complete treatment. Is it working? Is the modern-day approaches working for him? I, 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 I will... Uh, pass, the, pass the ball to him, but let me just say this, Pam. I believe that if Brent would have gone through treatment 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, he'd have failed miserably. Traditional treatment doesn't work today for people like him. Traditional treatment tries to convince the addict or the alcoholic that they're ruining their life. We would have gotten any, nowhere with Brent trying to convince him of that and that he needs to quit unless we stabilize the brain. So, yeah, that's a lot of sense. Yeah. So, share with us, how did you start on drugs? How old were you? 
I first smoked pot when I was about 14, 15 years old. And, um, you know, I used it recreationally through high school. Buddies of mine, we'd go skip class and go get high and, you know, we didn't think it was any big deal at the time. And towards the end of my high school um, career, I started selling a lot of cocaine. And uh, the day I graduated high school, I used cocaine for my first time. I was mixing that and I was smoking pot at the same time and a little bit of drinking. And um, it wasn't until about three, four years after that where I started actually selling pills. And how that became is that, you know, I was trying to recycle the money in my pocket. You know, I had this couple thousand dollars in my pocket I didn't know what to do with. And so I started buying pills and I was selling those for a long time, long time before I started using them actually. I became really comfortable with them. I saw a lot of these functioning addicts, how they went by every day. And as long as they came and saw me, they got by just fine. So I thought, well, you know, maybe I might try these things. And um, when I first used opiates, it was, um, it was one night when I was doing a lot of coke and, um, and a buddy of mine told me that, you know, if you try one of these pills, they'll help you come down. And so, you know, it worked that night. And I thought, wow, this is kind of a revelation. Maybe I might be able to get off Coke, start doing these pills, and maybe this might make me a better person. I don't know where the thought process was at there. I don't know if there was much of one, but that was how it started. And the next thing you know, you know, I wasn't using Coke that often anymore. It was maybe a couple times a month, but I was using pills every day. And I thought I had made a major breakthrough. You know, I was starting to gain weight a little bit and you know, until I start using them too heavy and then that weight, dimin that weight diminished drastically. And I used that all the way up until the point where I went to prison. <clears throat> so I did a... Uh, How old were you when I went to prison? I was 23 when I went to prison. I did eight months in uh, the Washington State Penitentiary and I, uh, I got out and I started working a job and uh, it wasn't the healthiest job, um, the environment and uh, and so I switched jobs, and in the meantime, I was in a car accident, and uh, just right before that, I had started using opiates again. I started doing these pills again, and uh, I remembered right away why I liked doing them. Can you say what pills? Oxycontin 30s. Okay. They're an epidemic right now. They're everywhere. I can't tell you how many people I know who are addicted to them, and it's an ugly, ugly disease. I mean, the addiction is beyond belief at how many people are addicted, and they can't get by day to day without a handful of these things. How do they get them? From drug dealers. Okay. And they come up from all over the country, everywhere. People who have prescriptions, they sell them off, they do some. They actually, they'll, they'll sell them off and then turn around and go buy more pills. It's just the thought process isn't there. It's, it, they're not in their right mind. They're not using, it's not them who's thinking, it's the addiction. But this medication, these pills that they're taking and that you've been experimenting with, mm -hmm. they do something for you, you wouldn't use them. Absolutely. What do they do? Me, personally, they uh, gave me a bit of confidence at the beginning. I didn't use them because I didn't like them. I loved them. And, um, you know, I took over my relationship. You know, I had hurt a girlfriend really bad. I had hurt my family really bad. And, um, and they, you know, they took over everything. They did. So that feeling of not feeling good about yourself, you take the, your drugs, whatever you use, you felt better about you. So now in treatment, mm -hmm. are you addressing this? Is this what you've been addressing in treatment? Yeah. You know, what I'm coming to find is that um, I was using my addiction as almost a credit card to face emotions. I wasn't facing them. I was using, you know, this addiction and these pills to pretty much... You know, they came with me everywhere I went. Anytime I couldn't go ahead and take care of something on my own, i go ahead and charge it to this addiction. And, and, you know, until I was emotionally, just about financially, and with my family, I was, you know, I had maxed out that avenue. And it was time to do something different. I knew this wasn't the person I wanted to be for much longer. It was, I mean, it just took over everything. It just made me such an ugly person. I did things that, to this day, I wish I never did. But I know now that that's a different person. This isn't the same person who's sitting in this seat today. Well, we know, at, you know, we don't sit back and go, oh, when I grow up, I'm going to be rob people and hurt no. my family. That wasn't your intent. No. It's part of the addiction. I'm not giving you an hour or an excuse, but we need to forgive ourselves and do something different today. So share with us, what are you doing different today? Today I'm taking a moral inventory. I'm thinking about um, how I got started. 
the feelings and emotions and the things that I need to get grounded today. The things that, you know, were a personal weakness that I used, you know, these pills to help aid. And today I'm involved in treatment and we do about 39 hours a week involved in these rooms. And um, it's just, it's, it's just been the best thing for me. Bow Creek Recovery Center where I'm at right now. I've been there for almost 73 days and it's Wonderful. not only the old Brent, but it's a better Brent. Did your family know you were using? No, they had no idea. How did you hide it from them? Well, my parents lived over here in Boise and I lived in Tacoma and um, it's no better over there. It's just as bad over there. You know, it's just as much as an epidemic. It's a, it's a nationwide epidemic. There's people everywhere who are addicted to these things. And, um, you know, I had, I had this distance between them that they weren't able to see me because if they had seen me, they would have known that I lost enough weight and that I wasn't myself anymore. And, uh, you know, I, I told them what they wanted to hear on a day to day basis. You know, I'm doing great. I'm going to work. I just saw my girlfriend, she's doing good. But the truth of the matter is, is everything was falling to pieces. My relationship with that girl, my relationship at work, my work ethic, it was all falling to pieces. You had mentioned that uh, <clears throat> you were losing control. And what I'd like to point out, Pam, is one of those old sayings, I think it was Father Martin that first coined it, that first the man takes a drink, then the drink takes the man. Yes. And, and, and that's what we're dealing with today. I believe that the addiction that people like Brent, young people, are dealing with today is a more harsh addiction, especially with the brain. First he takes that pill and he's convinced himself. It sounds like you were telling yourself, well, this might help me get off the cocaine. Mm -hmm. And you convince yourself, hey, this is actually helping me. And that pill, first you take the pill, then the pill takes the pill, and then the pill takes the man. Yeah. And you lost your control. And you started ruining your life, and your family was hurt, and your girlfriend was hurt, and on and on and on. And what I'm trying to express, Pam, is that modern day addicts like Brent need medication assisted treatment or modern day treatment to help them stop the insanity. And then once he's able to stop the insanity, in your case, you took Suboxone, a medication that yes. helped stabilize the brain, and then you were able to uh, receive some of the counseling, and it was working, and now he's a success story in treatment. He volunteered to come and do your program, Pam, because he's, he's got the bug, the recovery bug. He's got the enthusiasm about recovery. He wants to spread the word, but I think it's still important that in your sh on your show mm -hmm. that he and I also express that there are modern day addicts that need more than traditional treatment for them to be successful. Would you agree with that, Brent? Entirely. Can you explain that uh, to the audience that did the Suboxone part help stabilize you and then you can hear the counselors? Entirely. Mentally, physically, emotionally, it stabilized me. I mean, I'm a huge advocate for this box and treatment. Mm -hmm. It helped me get to a place where I was, you know, I was at ease. I was ready to sit in these rooms because otherwise without it, the physical dependency on that addiction is beyond belief. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and without having that help and... Um, what is it like? The addiction, the, the withdrawals. Yeah. What does it feel like? A lot of the worst thing, the total loss of control. I mean, over your body, your body's doing things and it's reacting in a way that you've never experienced before. One it's, of the street terms is dope sick. Can you explain to the audience what's dope sick? Dope sick, the first thing that comes to mind is crawling down from my cell in prison and uh, having uncontrollable bowel movements mm -hmm. and then having to sit in that for the next day and a half. So to, to avoid that feeling, you would do anything? Anything. I mean, treatment, It you know, I thank God for Suboxone, you know, it, it's, it's been a huge factor at how I've been able to make progress today. Are you still on Suboxone? Yes, I am. And so somebody in the audience might say, well, you've substituted one drug for another because they're going to think maybe Suboxone is a drug when it's really a medication. Yes. 
So are you planning on coming off the Suboxone? Uh, yes. How does, how does that work? Have you and the doctor talked about that? That's what I was going to say is the doctor and I have talked about it quite extensively because I didn't think that I wanted to stay on Suboxone because, um, you know, it can be tough to get off of. You need to do it cold. You can't do it cold turkey. You need to taper off and you do it in time. And sometimes the best way to do it is blind without knowing that you're doing it because there's a mental part to it too. Mm -hmm. There's a part that thinks that, well, I need this amount. I need to, you know, I need this to get well and get through the day. But the fact of the matter is, is a lot of it can be mental, but you'll also feel the change. But if you're not expecting it or knowing that it's coming, mm -hmm. then you have a lot better chance of getting through that taper. Otherwise, um, you know, cold turkey, it, it, can, it can be a little rough, you know. I've experienced that too as well, and, you know, and it needs to be administered by a doctor, and you need to speak with him thoroughly at, you know, what avenue you want to take with this. And then, so I plan on taking it for about the next six months, and then I'll do a taper from there. And that gives my brain enough time to heal the receptors that were damaged from the time that I was using. And Pam, if I may add, you know, the younger you are, the better chance you have of, of getting off the medication quicker or being on it on the medication in a shorter period of time and we've talked about it in previous shows that you take like a what i would term as an old school junkie someone who has used uh, iv drugs like heroin for years and years 30 years they may need a stronger medication like methadone and they may be on methadone the rest of their lives there may be someone who's used a little longer than Brent who may need to be on Suboxone for two or three years before they taper off. But the younger they are, the, the better chance they have to stay on the medication in a shorter time span and come off the medication and be much more successful. That's the beauty about all the, we, you know, we get worried about young people coming out of the woodwork with addiction and a harder and stronger addiction than we've seen in the past. But because he's young, he stands a better chance of grasping the recovery mentally, physically, spiritually, and coming off the Suboxone quicker. He should be totally free from the medication six months from now and all of the addiction six months from now. So to me, Medication-assisted treatment is a modern-day approach that helps young people. That gives you that opportunity, that chance to absorb working in a program. Can you share with us what type of program you are working as far as your recovery program, like the 12 steps? Or yeah, you know, I, um, you know, we get up early in the morning. We go to the gym, which is uh, plays a huge factor into you know my day in and day out sobriety making sure I stay healthy and fit which is to me it's really important and uh, then we do groups for the rest of the day and there you the counselors there at Boat Creek they know how to dig deep and they know the right time to do it and they do an excellent job of it and um, you know they give you enough tools to be able to get back out there in society and not fail it's up to you though as the person it's up to me as the addict whether or not I'm gonna fail or not you know whether I want to use these tools or not that they've given me and a doctor <clears throat> just the other day actually he said something that meant a lot to me that he said you know you haven't failed yet if you leave here and you relapse now you failed because now you have the tools to not relapse now you know you you have a way out you know the path to follow and it's up to you whether or not you want to stay on that path you have a choice now I have a choice, I do. I truly believe that. I shared that in my last show. I've been sober 34 years. My brother has 39 years. Congratulations. One brother went in and out of prison for drug-related uh, crimes. One overdosed on opiates, and he's never been normal. And one's dead from alcoholism. They'd all been in, to the program. You got it. He nailed it right on, right off, because you have a choice. Once you know, then it is up to me. But also, could you share with us, what are some of those tools that they're, what's the main one that comes to your head that you'd like to share with our audience? First and foremost, you said it's up to me. It is, but it's a we thing. You can't do it yes. on your own. Thank you. You can try, and you can try, and you can try. And it failed me so many times, you know. I. 
it, without having help, without, I, you know, I didn't ask for help either. You know, it, it was something that came to me. It was an intervention with my family. And it was the biggest relief, you know, because that addiction took me down so fast. It was like grabbing onto an anchor. And it literally draw, drags you to the, just to the depths that you've never seen before or felt before. Mm -hmm. And when I agreed to come to treatment, it was like letting go of that anchor and, and I, I, I literally physically felt like I came above water and I just gasped for air. And, um, you know, and so the biggest thing is, is it's a wee thing. You got to ask for help. And that's a tough thing to do. It's, it's embarrassing and there's a big pride factor that gets in the way of that. And I had a lot of that. I might have one of the biggest egos that I know. He and does. Was, he does. <laughs> And it was tough. It, it was. And, you know, coming there to treatment and, you know, at first try and do a uh, dissect what pieces of treatment I may need. I need all of it. And I need more than just that. And that's why I keep going to these meetings and I stay in group. You know, when they ask if, you know, there's if it's if it's an option of whether or not we want to go or not some days to certain things, I always go because that's that's a big factor is, you know, the second day you know, take you off that leash and they ask you, you know, they give you the choice. That's when you really know whether or not someone's serious or not. And I've yet to miss a meeting. You know, I've heard him say many times in his recovery, this is the only disease that the person tells themselves they don't have. Yeah. Uh, question, because you missed something. You said your, you, your parents didn't know that you were having this problem. So how did they find out? How did this intervention happen? <clears throat> what happened there? I was trying to come off of these pills, uh, these Oxycontins, and um, and so I was taking Xanax in lieu of my quote-unquote self-dose that I was taking daily, and uh, I was trying to cut down, and I was using Xanax to comfort me from the withdrawals that I was anticipating, and um, those are strong. <laughs> Benzodiazepines is what they are, and uh, and it's a deadly combination, more than anything else they can take your life and you don't realize it. You may think you're helping yourself, but you're not. <clears throat> so, you know, I was falling asleep everywhere for, you know, uh, the remainder two days that I was, you know, in Tacoma. And, uh, it, you know, it came out, it came down to the point where my, my family came out to the garage and they found me asleep. And, you know, I was, I had been smoking a cigarette and the cigarette had fallen into my lap and it was burning a hole through myself and I slept right through it. And I, you know, I, my cousin woke me up finally after several attempts. And, uh, you know, I woke up and had myself convinced that nothing was wrong. He didn't know. And I went right upstairs and went to bed. And, uh, yeah, and that, that was, you know, I, I knew I had a problem. I knew I had a problem long before then. But, you know, I, I just didn't know how to ask for help. It's, it's not easy to do. It's a very shameful thing to have to do. Also, too, I've heard it's not just the shame. I know that's very difficult, to, you know, to reach out and ask for help. But isn't there also, correct me down if I'm wrong here, there's a part of the addict that just doesn't want to give it up. You yeah. know, they, they really don't. And they're going to try on their own to find a way to stop, right? And that's what I'm hearing you say, that you kept thinking that you could do this. And you also <clears throat> mentioned that you realize now you can't do this alone. But I don't think it's always the pride about asking for help. I think that little piece of us is saying, maybe I can beat this, maybe I can beat this. We can't. There's no way, there's no cure. There's treatment, Don's treatment, and what you're sharing here, it's very effective. If you want it. You can have it, definitely. So, so oh, I think Brent also gave a description of what commonly happens with young people nowadays. We had a show and we talked, you and I and Doc Bailey talked a lot about overdose and the problem with, uh, you know, overdose in America today. Overdose from heroin has surpassed fatal car accidents and the general public is not aware of that. He is fortunate to be here today. Well, I was just listening to his description of being found in the garage by family members. We know that benzos, medications like benzos mixed with opiates are deadly. That's how a lot of people die from overdose. We call it suicide 
uh, Hollywood suicide. They didn't even mean to die, but they overdosed that way. Brent is a classic case of someone who couldn't quit without help. When he says we, he means it, but I also think part of that we is the medical part. Mm -hmm. the, <clears throat> the doctor helping him get stabilized through medication. Yes, because he was playing doctor his own self. Exactly, on himself, exactly. Mm -hmm. use different and that's how we... To come off, yeah, we, it wasn't working. Yeah, no. we, lose, overdose. we lose thousands so and dangerous. thousands of people that way. Yeah. And, and so I would like to say to your audience that if you're an active user and you're watching this show, please do not, do not combine benzos with the opiates. That's Hollywood suicide. You're going to die. Alcohol and, and benzos, alcohol and opiates are deadly mixed together. People die from the overdose, not thinking that they were going to die. Uh, there's modern day treatment, there's approaches, medication assisted treatments, modern day treatment that can help people today. And uh, so Brent, if you know, if, if you were going to give a message to somebody out there in the next, you got 60 seconds to give a message yeah. to somebody out there before we pass it on to Pam, what would you say to somebody that's watching this show right now and that's uh, active in their addiction? Tomorrow's never going to come. It'll never come. You can try and you can try, but it's never going to come. Because if you don't take yourself out of that situation and make the difference and go actually do something about it, tomorrow will never come. And I can't tell you how many times I was going to quit tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Bow Creek Treatment Center, never, it never necessarily opened up the doors to uh, heaven but it did open up the doors to hell for me to walk out of. Oh. That's a good way to put Whoa. it. Yes. I like that. Yes. So if you're in trouble, don't hesitate to call Bull Creek Bella Vista Recovery <clears throat> Center. We'll treat you with dignity and respect, and you too can have your life back. Wow. Yeah, I can't thank you both enough for coming. You're saving lives. You're such a blessing to the community. I'm going to throw out one last question because it's from my friends at Facebook right now. There was a gentleman that got out of treatment. Two weeks later, he relapsed and overdosed. Okay, so mm -hmm. you're going to tell me what you're going to do to not let that happen. What are you going to do? I'm going to, stay active, in, I'm going to stay active in the program. I'm going to have someone I can go reach out to as soon as I make that first slip up and I know something's going to happen. I'm going to ask for help. You're going to call. First. Oh, first things first, I'm going to call. Who? Bow Creek. Um, my sponsor, someone who watches over me daily, okay. I talk to. Okay. Cause this is a terrible disease. People are dying, and I don't want to hear about yours. Okay? Thank you, Pam. You're important. Thanks we're for having so me. I'm so proud of you. Don, I want to thank you very much for coming on our show today. You are a blessing to the community. And do you know you're saving a lot of lives? Well, thank you for allowing us to be part of this show. And if anybody in your audience needs help or has questions, they can feel free to call Bow Creek, and we'll answer the questions, treat them with dignity and respect. Thank you. And thank you so much for coming on. You are such a blessing. I am just so excited for you and how well you're doing in the treatment center. I can't wait to hear more. You're going to keep stay in contact with me. Absolutely, right. Pam. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining us. We'll see you hopefully on the next episode, which is going to be Addiction While You're in Prison and How Do You Stay Clean and Sober When You're Locked Up.